everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to my channel, Kalanadi. Today I am going to review The Raven Stratagem by Yoon Ha Lee. This is, of course, the sequel to Nine Fox Gambit, which was one of my favorite books last year. I've been looking forward to this sequel so much and I loved it as much as the first book, so this is going to be a pretty glowing <laughs> review. Now, since I am reviewing a sequel, I'm not going to go into much detail about plot at this point because I don't want to ruin the book and I don't want to ruin the previous book if for some reason you are watching a review of the sequel and you haven't read the first book. A quick refresher, however, in Nine Fox Gambit we are introduced to the Hex Arcate, a vast space empire that seems to be powered by calendar technology in, in that, that their technology and weapons only seem to work because they use a specific calendar or they view time in a certain way. I tend to think of this in terms of a magical system rather than a scientific one just for ease of brain while reading, but I suspect all of this is really based on mathematics and maybe even um, the theory of relativity and how time works. In the first book, Captain Kelcheris of the Hexarchate is sent to retake the Fortress of Scattered Needles from heretics who are introducing calendrical rot into the Hexarchate, which means that if Cheris isn't able to take back the fortress from the heretics, the Hexarchate itself may be the next thing to fall because their system is undermined. To assist her, the Hexarchate lets her become the anchor for the mind of General Shuos Jadao, a long dead brilliant tactician who lived like 400 years before, went crazy, killed a bunch of people including his own people, and then was imprisoned in what's called the Black Cradle. And because he never lost a battle, the Hexarchate keeps him around and they pull him out of the Black Cradle whenever they need his assistance to win another battle. He's kind of implanted in Cheris's mind and she doesn't know if she can really trust him. She has to rely on him to help her win this battle, but he's supposed to be crazy. Is he really crazy? Why would he have gone crazy? And if he's actually sane, why has he been doing some of this stuff? What is his plan? Then we move on to the Raven Stratagem, which picks up right after the end of Nine Fox Gambit. There is no lag, there is no lost time, we just get right back into the story, but with some key differences which I will get to in a moment. In the Raven Stratagem, it appears that Jadao is now in control. He is loose, he has taken over Cheris's body, and what is he going to do next? He takes command of a Kel Swarm and says, he's going to fight the Hexarchate's enemies, which nobody really expects. They really think that he's going to turn on the Hexarchate because he's supposed to be crazy, right? He can't really be out there doing the good work for them, right? There are two things that I think make The Raven Stratagem a very, very different book from a Nine Fox Gambit in positive ways because there are reasons why I really love this book as much as Nine Fox Gambit. The first one is that The Raven Stratagem is a lot easier to read. Um, a lot of people have talked about how difficult Nine Fox Gambit is to get through, to understand what's going on, because Yoon Ha Lee doesn't explain anything. He expects the reader to do the hard work of figuring out what is going on and how things work uh, by being immersed in the story. But that does mean that the beginning of Nine Fox Gambit is so confusing and it's hard to push through when you feel overwhelmed by all these details that make no sense. Now, I'm one of those people that really loves that sensation. I enjoy uh, feeling like I'm not being spoon-fed and that um, feeling of accomplishment when I get to the end of, of the book and I understand it now. But the Raven Stratagem was a breather after all that. It's like the reward, you figured out everything and now you're just getting into the story and it's great because you understand what is happening. But this does mean that for me the reading experience was nothing at all like what I had prepared myself for. I ended up enjoying it but I really had to revise my expectations of what it was going to feel like to read this book. 
The second thing is that the point of view characters change, and I've already seen some reviews from people who have really not liked this. I ended up liking it for two reasons that I will explain why I think this is very necessary. Nine Fox Gambit is almost entirely told from Cheris's point of view, and a lot of people have become attached to Cheris. I really enjoyed being in her head as well, and the first time that this book shifted away from her point of view, I was really disappointed as well. But then I became happy about it. There are three or four characters who are introduced here that you see the story from. Uh, one of them is the General Kirov of the Kel Swarm that Jadao takes over. Uh, another is her former aide, the Lieutenant Colonel Brazan, who's kind of kicked off the ship and then wants to come back and get rid of Jadao and help Kirov take command again. And then the Shuos Hexarch, the, the leader of the Shuos faction inside of the Hexarchate, named Mikodes, who I loved reading from his point of view so much. That guy is a character, like kind of in a flamboyant, crazy way, and is one of my favorite characters in this series so far. I mean, Jadao is probably my favorite, favorite character, but Mikodes might be a close second. And why, why this change in perspectives, though? Why is that necessary? The first one that I can't talk about too much because I would ruin things is that the end makes it clearer that the reader can't know certain things, can't be in Cheris slash Jadao's head for reasons. Um, Cheris has a point of view at the beginning and then one more at the end, and I will say no more than that. The second thing, which is what I really enjoyed this switch of characters for, is it adds depth to the world. It lets you see the Hexarchate and its enemies, its system, its history from multiple views, and not just different characters, but people who have different politics. Um, it also lets you see more of the factions up close. Um, the first book was mostly about the Kel and the Shuos, which are um, like the military, the armed forces, and the, the spies, respectively. Um, you get to see more of them in here as well, but you also have an Andan character who is very interesting. Not, not a point of view character, but uh, a, a major secondary character. I think that this is completely necessary for the story because this is about understanding how the Hexarchate system came about, what it is now, and how unjust and broken it may have become, and why people would want to find a different way of governing themselves. It's kind of a rebellion story in a really complicated way, spanning hundreds of years and multiple people's agendas, but that's kind of where it's working towards, is people saying, we have lived this way for so long, but actually it may be a terrible way of living and we should consider doing something different that doesn't treat millions of people like disposable assets. The first book, Nine Fox Gambit, was really depressingly about collateral damage, about how disposable people were. And that made me kind of depressed. Like, I hated so many of the decisions that major characters made in Nine Fox Gambit because hundreds, tens of thousands, millions of people would die in one fell swoop, and I couldn't really root for any one person because of that. But in the Raven Stratagem, I felt like there were more people and more um, political views that I could get behind that I could root for, which made me um, a lot happier by the end. Because, like, I love Night Fox Gambit, but it depressed me in some ways, but I was much happier while reading The Raven Stratagem. The other thing that I want to throw in here about reading The Raven Stratagem is that I picked up on the humor a lot more. Um, I have thought that some of Yoon Ha Lee's short stories had a wonderful humorous streak in them, and I, I enjoy his type of humor. Um, uh, it was more obvious to me in this book. I don't recall if there was this amount of uh, joking and humor and stuff in Nine Fox Gambit, but for whatever reason, it just amused me so much more in The Raven Stratagem, and I really appreciated that. And that is everything I think that I want to say about The Raven Stratagem. I love this book as much as the first book. I gave it five stars as well, which uh, doesn't happen all the time. And at this point, I have no idea what to expect from, from the third installment because it could once again be a completely different type of story. But at this point, I trust that it will be just as brilliantly told and put together as the previous two books. 
If you have read The Raven Stratagem and you want to discuss it, please leave me a comment down below. If you want to talk spoilery stuff, just make sure that that information is below the cutoff point for the comment teasers so other people aren't accidentally spoiled. Thank you so much for watching this review, and I will talk to you again in my next video, and until then, bye.